The international style was international throughout Europe. Uh, so now we want to look at the international style in Germany. And we're talking about the very early 15th century here. The very first documented German painter where we can connect his name with paintings that still exist, extant paintings, is Master Bertram. Now, according to documentation, he came from the town of Midden in Westphalia. Uh, Westphalia is over in um, western Germany, uh, the area that Köln and Essen and a number of other uh, well-known cities today are. Um, but he came to Hamburg, and that's where we have the information. He settled in Hamburg and became the head of a major workshop there. And as you can see, he was in Hamburg from uh, 1367 to his uh, death in 1415. We do know that he made a pilgrimage to Rome in 1390, but we don't really see anything that says Roman or Italian uh, in his artwork. In fact, the closest thing of surviving artwork, and of course a lot of artwork doesn't survive from this early date, but the closest thing is probably from Bohemia. Um, you'll remember Master Theodoric of Prague, and we talked about the short, uh, stocky figures with, that were uh, quite volumetric. And Master Bertram also has sort of uh, stocky figures, uh, short, you know, the head is rather uh, large in relationship to the body, uh, with simple volumetric drapery folds that seem to suggest a solidity, a three-dimensionality uh, to the figure. So in that way, he's similar to Master Theodoric. However, as we'll see, Master Bertram seems to be uh, what lighter in spirit his artwork does. Uh, there's some whimsical touches, uh, some things that just seem to our modern eyes to be absolutely charming. The surviving work by Master Bertram is a large altarpiece. It's called the St. Peter Altarpiece from 1379, and it's from the Church of St. Peter's in Hamburg. Now, this is a schnitzalter, or a uh, schnitz means to cut. <laughs> uh, so it's a carved wooden shrine. And as you can see, this is opened up in the inside. You have a crucifixion in the center, and then uh, two rows of statues of saints, and then a predella below, a lower piece that uh, holds it up off of the altar so you can open the, um, the wings. Uh, probably designed by Master Bertram. But if you close this, we see 24 uh, painted panels. Here's the wooden shrine. Uh, when it's open, it's all of six feet high and 24 feet across. And you have that crucifixion with uh, 24 statues of saints and prophets. But on the outside, we have a whole series of little pictures, uh, like the ones you're looking at here. Uh, scenes from the creation uh, to the story of Adam and Eve, from their children, Cain and Abel, uh, to uh, the patriarch Jacob, and then the infancy of Christ. So let's take a look at those. This is what you would see with the two central panels closed. The wooden sculpture is beneath the painted altar wings. And then you have another side, another uh, set of wings or shutters or side panels that extend out on either side. And I'm not sure whether those can be shut or whether they are fixed in place. But it has double wings, as you can see. Now, at this first opening, we have the 24 painted panels that cover up the wooden shrine. And here, look at the upper left, 
and you're going through on each side there's three different scenes on each panel uh, so you've got uh, the scenes of the creation uh, of the universe and of uh, the earth and there's see the plants and the creation of the animals and then we see uh, the creation of Adam and Eve the sin of Adam and Eve uh, we're going clear across uh, the expulsion from Eden is in that last uh, panel, the one on the right. Uh, you can see the angels uh, is uh, forcing Adam and Eve out. And then the very, very last panel in the top row on the right uh, is uh, Eve is spinning and Adam is delving. Adam is uh, has a hoe or a mattock or some kind of tool and he's trying to... Uh, make he's trying to plot he's trying to break up the soil so he can plant a uh, seed to uh, you know to defeat himself and his family and then down below uh, we have uh, the story of their children uh, all growing up now uh, Cain and Abel and uh, they make their offerings to God and God rejects Cain's offering uh, so he is very angry and he kills his brother Abel. And then we see other scenes uh, from the Old Testament. Uh, you can see, make out, for example, the sacrifice of Isaac here. Uh, in the, would be, if you're counting, uh, would be the fourth uh, scene on the bottom row or the first one in the second panel. And uh, those go through the story of Jacob here, still in the second panel. And then the other half, uh, starting here with the third panel, is the infancy of Christ. We start with the Annunciation, uh, the Nativity, the Adoration of the Three Kings, the Presentation in the Temple, uh, the Massacre of the Innocents, and the rest on the flight into Egypt. So let's just look a few of these and see what he's doing. Uh, as you can see, we all have this gold background. It's uh, considered timeless, eternal, seven times heavenly. Uh, uh, sp spiritual, if you will. And uh, on this first panel, you see the creation. Uh, the light is separated from the dark. You see the uh, devil is going down into dark. Uh, so we also have the fall of the rebel angels, which is not in the Bible, uh, but is uh, you know, a, a story often uh, associated with uh, the what early days of existence of the world. Uh, and then he has uh, creating the sun and the moon and the stars. And then down below, we see the story of Cain and Abel. And of course, these go across uh, the entire four panels uh, in first the top row and then the bottom row. Uh, so the stories aren't continuous within one panel. But you see the continuation of the creation of the world. God's creating the plants. He's got trees growing there. And then that wonderful image that we saw of the creation of the animals uh, early on. And uh, the creation of Adam. And down below, uh, you can see uh, the sacrifice of Isaac. Um, Isaac now growing up and an old man uh, with his son Esau. And uh, of course, uh, the story of Jacob and Esau is when uh, Jacob uh, tricks his brother out of his birthright and then uh, tricks his father, uh, Isaac, into giving Jacob the blessing that was intended for Esau. So we see those two scenes there. And then, once again, this is the third scene, the top, the creation of Eve. Uh, the God is giving them their directions, essentially. He's forbidding them to take fruit from the tree of knowledge. But they do it anyway. The fall of man or original sin, where you have the serpent in the center uh, and uh, Adam is taking the fruit and Eve is eating the fruit. And that, of course, brings both sin and death uh, and disease uh, into the world.
And down below, we see the cure for this, um, the coming of Christ to redeem the sins of Adam and all of uh, his progeny, which includes all of mankind. So we have the Annunciation, the Nativity, uh, the Adoration, the Magi. You notice that everything is fairly simply told. Uh, you know, there's uh, not a lot of background or detail, but it makes it all the clearer for that. And then we're continuing the scene of Adam and Eve at the top. Uh, you have God confronting Adam and Eve, and they are being expelled from Eden and then they have to work in the world and uh, bring forth uh, uh, the sustenance to enable them to survive by the, you know, the sweat of their brow, the work of their bodies. Down below, we see more scenes of the infancy of Christ, the presentation in the, te in the temple. And of course, this is when um, Simeon makes his prophecy that uh, this child is for the rise and fall of many. And it's also when he you know, declares Christ to be the Savior because he's been promised he will see the Savior before he dies. And he says, you know, now let my, thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. Then we see the massacre of the innocents with King Herod there ordering his soldiers to kill the babies. And of course, uh, Mary and Joseph have fled that. Uh, they're on their way to Egypt and here they are taking a break. Uh, Mary is uh, seated there uh, nursing the child and uh, Joseph is in the center and the, it looks like the donkey's having a little snack too of the grass perhaps. <laughs> So essentially, it's creation, sin, you know, some references to the patriarchs of Isaac and his family, and then the coming of Christ into the world. And as you see, God is represented as Christ. Uh, you'll remember that Christians believe in a triune God. Uh, that God is three persons in one being. God the Father, God the Son, who is Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit, and all combined in one. And the idea is that they are all, that uh, Christ is co-eternal with the Father, as the Nicene Creed says. Um, that he did not come into being at the time of the Incarnation, which we see uh, in the next panel that I'm showing you here, uh, the Annunciation, um, but that he was always united with God. He was eternal. Uh, only his body uh, came into history at a particular time uh, and lived as a mortal. So we often do see uh, Christ uh, they would say perhaps amalgamated with God, uh, uh, as God, uh, being the creator. And this has a, been a long history back to uh, manuscripts that we think, um, many of them have been destroyed, but uh, there's um, sur some surviving pictures copied from a fourth century manuscript, for example. Uh, and certain Carolingian manuscripts uh, from the ninth century will show a similar idea. Um, Christ is called the Word, the Logos or the Verbum, and God creates by his Word. So this would explain why um, they're showing a figure that mo looks more like Christ uh, look like, than perhaps the white-bearded or gray-bearded uh, God the Father. Now, the creation is occurring by the word. So he's pulled a little rib, that's that little curving form, uh, off the side of Adam. And from this is uh, sprouting, is growing up uh, Eve uh, with her hands raised in prayer uh, or in praise. Uh, and uh, we only see uh, part of her body, presumably she's in the process of coming into being. The little musical angels uh, up in the corners. And then uh, 
we're looking at the Annunciation. Now this is when Christ uh, enters the world as a mortal, but you, you, you really uh, can't see him within the womb of Mary, but we can see him. Uh, here we have God the Father up in the corner, sending Christ, who is like a little infant with the cross on his shoulder. You know, God knows what's going to happen. He's sending Christ uh, to die for the sins of mankind. And it's, it's like he's following the Holy Spirit. Well, I guess that would make sense. There's this little dove uh, that symbolizes the Holy Spirit heading right straight for Mary. Um, and, you know, how is Mary impregnated? She is overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. And then, of course, uh, the uh, uh, Christ child will have to enter her womb. So uh, they're kind of on the way in this picture. Uh, and you have the angel who has arrived uh, and is uh, giving her the news. Uh, so these very, very frequent in Annunciations is that Mary is often showing reading. Now, in this case, she's, she seems to have several books. Uh, she seems to be quite a scholar because books were pretty rare and valuable. Uh, traditionally, she is reading the verse from Isaiah, a virgin will conceive and bear a child. Um, but, you know, here it's, it's almost like she has some reference books as well. Uh, Mary is turned out to us. She's uh, kneeling at this uh, little lectern uh, reading bench, and the angel has his back toward us, um, sort of about three quarters of the back uh, toward us. And then you know, there's a little bit of turning. His, his uh, one leg is uh, invisible. It's on the other side of his body, presumably. And uh, the other is seen in profile. And then we see the profile of the head, but we see um, a greater expanse of the back. So this suggests to us that, you know, that there actually is three-dimensional space. Uh, we have a flat gold background, but the angel uh, you know, seems to be able to turn in space. We can see his back. We can see his profile. If you look at Mary, you'll see that uh, her draperies, uh, her mantle uh, wraps around her. And uh, there is this modeling in light and dark where you have a fold, you have a dark shadow, and then a, a light highlight. So that also suggests uh, the idea of three-dimensionality uh, within this, uh, you know, what, um, this uh, simplified space. And moving from Hamburg to the west, uh, we're going to Cologne or Kalm, Germany. Uh, this, of course, is in Westphalia uh, and is um, you know, a major, major city, uh, not too far over the border with what is today Belgium. And we're going to look at uh, an artist who we don't know his name. Now, very frequently, we do not know the names of the artists who created works of art. But if we have a number of works of art where the style is so similar that we're pretty sure it's by the same artist or their workshop, we give them a conventional name. And sometimes they're named after um, a particular painting or a uh, uh, there's one, for example, it's the Master of 1499, uh, because that date is in one of the paintings. Sometimes it's something that is in the painting. There's a Master of the Embroidered Foliage, for example. Um, in this case, the artist is named after this painting. It's a painting of Saint Veronica. And so the artist is known as the Master of Saint Veronica. He seems to have been a leading artist in Kalm at the beginning of the 15th century. And he's very famous for painting these, well, charming, uh, just delightful, almost, we often say almost doll-like uh, figures. This is a devotional image. And you have a legend uh, of Veronica's veil. And in this legend, um, there was a woman who 
when Christ was carrying the cross to Golgotha to be crucified, she took her veil and she wiped his face with it, wiped the blood and the sweat from his face. And for that act of compassion, she received a miracle. The face of Christ impressed on her cloth. So Christ's face is miraculously impressed on her cloth. And this is one, uh, probably the most famous, but one of several images that were believed to be not made by human hands. In other words, they were miraculous images of Christ. Uh, there's another story uh, about a king of Ethiopia who was uh, very ill and he uh, had heard about this, um, this man who could heal the sick. And he sends uh, one of his servants uh, to Christ and asks him to come to Ethiopia and heal the king. And Christ doesn't make that trip. But what he does do is take a cloth and press it against his face and hands it to the servant and he receives a cloth with this face on it. Uh, and then the servant, and he says, take it back. And he takes it back and uh, by this miraculous image, the king is healed and uh, you know becomes Christian and uh, converts his country. So. Uh, there are a number of these images that are uh, believed to be not made by human hands. I think uh, scholars and art historians uh, think a lot of them are Byzantine images. Uh, in this case, of course, uh, Saint, the St. Veronica Master has painted this image. It's not the actual cloth of St. Veronica uh, that is um, in the Vatican, I believe, today, or has been in the Vatican at one point. Uh, he's painting a picture of uh, his, I guess we would say his imaginary uh, version of this. But you can see that the face of Christ is, is held up um, for our veneration. And the woman uh, is you know, holding this and we have a name for her. She's known as Veronica, Saint Veronica. Her name comes from the Latin for true image, the Vera Icon. So the Vera Icon, the, the Veronica, is the cloth itself, also known as the Pseudorim. There's so many names for this. Uh, the cloth with the miraculous image of Christ's face. And the woman herself becomes known as Vera Icon, as Veronica. Now, this is an example of what we call an Andachsbild. If there's more than one, if it's plural, they're Andachsbild-er, E-R. Uh, this is an image for contemplation. One of the fun things about German is you can create words by putting other words together. So uh, let's break this down. The word Bild means image. Danken uh, would be to think. And so it's sort of a to think on picture, a, a image for contemplation. Uh, we said it's a devotional image rather than narrative. There are narrative images of this um, subject uh, where you have a picture of the way of the cross and you have uh, St. Veronica uh, and either holding the cross, having already received the vision or uh, you know, uh, putting it up to wipe Christ's face. This idea of having images that are devotional um, and really tug at the hearts of the believers. Uh, in, in this case, it's from the Rhineland, and so we sometimes will associate it with Rhenish mysticism. Um, there were a number of 14th century mystics uh, who sometimes had visions, uh, or sometimes tried to, in contemplation, unite themselves with God. Um, one of them is very much associated with some of um, the devotional practices, and that is Heinrich Susel, S U. S-O. Um, and 
he was a monk and very devoted uh, to the, he wanted to feel the sufferings of Christ. Uh, and he did some things that we might consider to be extremely extreme, such as nailing a cross on his chest. Obviously, the nails were not really long, or it would have killed him. Um, but he did things like that. Um, he also was very instrumental in developing the idea of the Stations of the Cross. He would designate places in the monastery or in his cell, different sites uh, on the way of Jerusalem. And, and he would go and imagine he was going on this journey uh, through Christ's life. Um, so you can see that this beautiful little panel with this charming uh, saint um, could certainly be used for devotion. Uh, for the person uh, praying in front of it, uh, maybe beating on their breast, uh, thinking of, you know, this is Christ has died. You know, I'm looking right into this image of his face. Um, and he's died for my sins. You know, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. Uh, I said it's also charming, and that seems to be something that the, the, uh, the artists from Cologne like to do, uh, have these delightful little angels uh, here uh, down in the corner. And of course, here is this uh, beautiful face, this uh, beautiful oval face of uh, St. Veronica. It's rounded, you know, in light and dark. We certainly have a sense that uh, she is three-dimensional. Uh, we sometimes say that these figures uh, seem almost doll-like, and they're certainly very charming. Uh, it's this ideal female figure for the time, uh, very quiet, uh, very modest. Uh, you know, her eyes are downcast. She's not putting yourself forward, she's showing us this relic. Um, and this is another painting that's attributed to the master of St. Veronica. Um, as you see, it's called the Small Calvary. It's a crucifixion scene with all of the uh, narrative details of a crucifixion. Uh, so we could call it historiated, you know, which means there's the narrative, the story is going on. Uh, we see on the lower left, uh, which would be Christ's right, uh, uh, the Virgin Mary uh, succored by the holy women and St. John. And uh, uh, then on the lower left, uh, you know, we have the uh, soldiers uh, dicing for Christ's robe. Uh, you know, here's all the bad guys. Uh, then we have sort of this middle ground. Uh, with um, you know, Christ's side being pierced with the lance, and you can see an angel flying down from heaven, as it were, with a chalice uh, to capture, to uh, collect the blood of Christ. And of course, this relates it directly to the Eucharist, uh, to uh, the sacrifice of the altar, where um, the crucifixion is reenacted in the bread, which is the body of Christ, and the blood, which is believed to be the and the wine, which is believed to be the blood of Christ. Uh, and then on either side of Christ, we have the two thieves. Now, if you've read the story of the crucifixion, you know that uh, one of the thieves mocked Christ. You know, you're supposed to be so great, and here you're just dying with us. Uh, and the other thief uh, believes in him. And so they talk about the bad thief and the good thief. And the good thief is the one who's on Christ's right, so our left. And Christ says, today you will be with me in paradise. Uh, you can see that all these figures are, are slender. Uh, I'm, uh, some of them I almost want to call wispy. Uh, and of course, you still have that gold background that makes this a, a timeless image, even though you have all of these um, you know, narrative scenes to uh, sort through and, and, and think about. Another painting from the Rhineland, which continues that idea of these just you know, charming, delightful little saints, um, is the Paradise Garden or the Garden of Paradise uh, in the Stadel, the museum in Frankfurt. Uh, and so this artist is known as the master of the Frankfurt Paradise Garden. And what you see is a beautiful walled garden with this little crenellated wall going around. Um, the reference to this is the hortus conclusus. Hortus means garden, conclusus would be enclosed. Uh, 
And so you have the enclosed garden that is mentioned in Song of Solomon. Um, you know, the bride of Song of Solomon is an enclosed garden, uh, which is believed to be a reference to her virginity. And in the 12th century, uh, several authors, Rupert of Dutz and Honorius of Atan, uh, wrote commentaries on the Song of Songs or the Song of uh, Solomon, interpreting the bride as Mary. And so you have this long history of uh, a kind of allegory about God's love. Uh, the Song of Solomon is a it seem, seemingly erotic love poem, a very beautiful love poem uh, for uh, supposedly King Solomon and uh, one of his wives. Uh, and it was originally interpreted as God's love for the Hebrew people. And, therefore in included in the Bible. Uh, and then with the Christians, they interpreted it as the love of God for the individual soul or the love of uh, Christ for the uh, Christian church. And because Mary was symbolically associated with the church, um, it becomes a symbol of Mary and the love of Christ for his mother. That's all symbolic, of course. Uh, so the, the different attributes that are given to the bride in Song of Solomon are now given to Mary. Uh, the rose of Sharon, I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valley, or uh, I am an enclosed garden. And uh, here we see uh, Mary within the garden that symbolizes her virginity. Um, and she has with her uh, other uh, saints, uh, you know, three young ladies and uh, uh, three uh, male saints, I guess. Well, one of them is an angel, so he would be genderless. So, uh, but at any rate, uh, we ha can identify some of them. Uh, the figure who's picking cherries may be Saint Dorothy. Uh, Dorothy, of course, was supposed to have picked uh, roses uh, and pass those down from heaven as a sign that she, after her martyrdom, she had arrived in, in heaven. Um, we have the Virgin Mary reading, and we have another an unidentified virgin saint who's dipping water from the well. And then there's one who uh, seems to be I want to say giving the Christ child some music lessons. Maybe not. Maybe he already knows how to play. After all, he's God. Uh, but she's offering this musical instru instrument called a psaltery to the Christ child. And then we have these th three knightly saints. Uh, they're militant saints. They were uh, soldiers of one kind. Uh, the one with the wings is St. Michael the Archangel. Uh, and why is he associated with a soldier? Well, he is the one who in the book of Revelation battles the dragon, which is the devil. And he casts the devil down into the pit. Uh, and then uh, we see in the, foremo the foreground uh, here, uh, St. George with this uh, I almost feel sorry for this tiny little dragon here <laughs> beside him. Uh, and then another saint, uh, they're not quite sure who it is, but it's been suggested that he could be Saint Sebastian, who was a uh, martyr, uh, who was a Roman soldier who uh, was martyred. So here we have uh, a detail of Saint Cecilia offering the psaltery uh, to the Christ child. And Saint Cecilia is the patron saint of music. That's why, that's how we're identifying her. Uh, and the Christ child seems to be uh, very adept at plucking the strings, as you can see. And just uh, charming, beautiful, filled with flowers. One of the artists whose name we do know is um, an artist from the Rhineland who settles in Hamburg and is documented there. Uh, he's known as Master Franca, and his work does seem to have a particularly spiritual and emotive 
emotional content. It has been suggested that he is a friar. There is a, a brother, Franco, uh, who is mentioned. So that would be, you know, Franca would be the, uh, the German for that, uh, who was a Dominican uh, friar, a Dominican brother. Um, of course, we can't be sure that that is who he is, uh, possibly. So we call him Master Franca rather than Brother Franco. <laughs> now, uh, one of the works that is uh, by Master Franca is known as the Engelfaren altarpiece. Engelfaren, uh, you can see England in that, and uh, Faren is to tra is the tra traveling. Uh, going places, essentially. So this was the altarpiece of the Hamburg merchants who traded with England. So they would, you know, foreign to England. They would go to England. Um, and they had a chapel in the Church of St. John in Hamburg. And this would have been, uh, not this picture alone, uh, but a series of images uh, created by Master Franca uh, make up the Engelfaren altarpiece, and unfortunately, I don't have uh, a picture. I think they, I don't think the entire thing exists. I think that they probably have s uh, separated the images, but I'm not sure. So here we have a nativity uh, in which the Virgin Mary is dressed in a white robe and she's kneeling and you can see God the Father is looking down from heaven and the rays of light are coming down on the ground uh, and meeting uh, the Christ child who, from whom there are rays of light coming. Uh, this particular type of nativity in which the Christ child is on the ground naked and shining, as the text tells us, is known as a Brigittine Nativity. It's from a very popular book, uh, The Revelations of St. Bridget, or Santa Brigitta, of Sweden. And Santa Brigitta went to the Holy Land and in the various places uh, where Christ and his mother you know, had lived and done various things, she had visions. And when she arrived at the grotto of the Nativity in Bethlehem, she had a vision of the birth of Christ. Mary showed her how it was. And in it, Mary is wearing a white garment uh, Joseph has uh, gone off to fetch the midwives, and, and Mary's there alone, and she's wearing a white garment. And Bridget says, suddenly, I, I know not by what means, you know, the child was in Mary's womb, and then it is on the ground, naked and shining. The idea is that the birth was miraculous, uh, that the birth did not uh, tear Mary's Hymen, uh, you know, it, it, she retained her intact virginity, um, and it did not descend through the normal birth canal through the womb, from the womb. Um, but in one moment, you know, it's in her womb. The next moment, on the ground, it's a miracle. Um, and. Then Saint Bridget says that Mary kneels. And uh, she says, uh, you know, she adores the child. She says, be welcome, my Lord and my God. And uh, then reaches down to pick up the Christ child. So let's look at some of the elements here. Now, you'll notice that in this picture, uh, there is no stable. There is what appears to be a cave. And that is the grotto of the nativity, the cave of the nativity. Um, in the fourth century, St. Helena, who was the mother of the Emperor Constantine, uh, St. Helena went to the Holy Land and tried to identify the different sites where uh, different important uh, Christian events had occurred. And in Bethlehem, she identifies this cave as the place where the nativity takes place. Now, the Bible doesn't say it took place in a stable. It says that the child was laid in a manger, which suggests 
that uh, it was a stable, but I suppose it would be possible to use uh, some kind of, of cave as a stable. Uh, at any rate, that's where the uh, image of the grotto of the Nativity comes in. It is a reference to the uh, place that pilgrims go to uh, when they want to visit the place of the birth of Christ, uh, the place that was identified by St. Helena, uh, and of course is near to the church of the Nativity in Bethlehem. And that, of course, is where St. Bridget went and where St. Bridget had her vision. Uh, I think it was 1372. It might have been 73, but I think that was the year of her vision. So let's look at some of the details. Uh, we see that uh, keynote, if you will, of the Bridgetine Nativity. When you see a child on the ground, naked and shining, uh, here the rays of light, you know, come from the child. Uh, these are golden rays. Uh, that's, that says this is a Bridgetine Nativity. Uh, it is from the vision of St. Bridget. And there we have this, this banderol, as we call them, this scroll that comes out and tells us what Mary is seeing. Uh, you can kind of think of it like the bubbles they put in cartoons that they put words in. Uh, and in Latin, uh, she is saying, my Lord, my son, uh, which of course corresponds to uh, Bridget's uh, vision where she says, be welcome, my Lord and my God. And there is God the Father looking down from heaven, uh, shedding light, uh, uh, shedding right on the Christ child, uh, looking through the clouds. Now, stylistically, what do we see here? We see, once again, we talk about these charming doll-like figures. And there's a lot of pattern here. We've got this red sky. Uh, which is basically just a pattern background, and it has a, a pattern of red stars, you know, uh, neatly arranged uh, in rows. Uh, and then, you know, we have the suggestion of landscape uh, with the uh, trees, which are small, presumably saying, okay, this is further back. Uh, but if you look at how close they appear to be, let's say, to the ox and the ass who are eating from the manger, um, they seem awful small. They don't seem to be far enough back, if you will. Um, but we do have things that suggest space. Of course, just overlapping figures and objects suggest space. You know, Mary looks like she's in front of the grotto. And the angel, uh, there's one angel behind her holding up her uh, robe, her mantle. And then there's one angel in front of her with the wing uh, coming over and almost uh, kind of feeling like it's sheltering Christ. It's a visual, of course, she, it, it, the angel would be spatially in front. Now that angel that's seen from the back, uh, and we see that the legs go back and are foreshortened, that suggests space. That suggests that the figure can turn in space. That you can see them from the front, we can see them from the back, we can see the side, um, and of course uh, there is the foreshortening. So you have this kind of, uh, what's it, push and shove between, or, so you have this kind of tension between elements like the red sky that seems to negate space, uh, the, the trees that sometimes seem to be too small for where they are, uh, and yet you have these things like uh, some shading in the garments or the angel who's seen from the back with foreshortened legs and those suggest space. And we have, of course, up on the mountainside, this little image of the Annunciation to the shepherds with the uh, blue-robed angel flying in uh, uh, to tell the uh, shepherds that the child has been born and that they should go and see him. So we have uh, these little small trees and this distant view. If you look at it just this way, then you say, okay, well, I understand why those trees are small. Uh, the figures here are also quite small. 
And just to show you some other scenes from that altar piece, uh, this is the Adoration of the Magi. And now you'll notice here you have a kind of shed or stable uh, instead of the grotto or the cave. Uh, and there even seems to be a bed in it. Uh, the Magi presumably came later. Uh, was Mary still in the shepherd? Uh, was Mary still at the grotto slash uh, stable at the time, or had they moved to more comfortable surroundings? Um, Bible isn't specific about that. Uh, we do see the three magi. We always say there were three wise men uh, because they brought three gifts, and we assume that everybody brought one gift. Uh, the, the magi represented the three ages of man and the three known continents. So you have uh, Europe, Asia, and Africa. And this one has you know, a dark complected uh, uh, magus, so presumably it's the African magus. And that image seems to develop in Germany. It seems to be the earliest examples are German. Um, I think the earliest one they've identified is around 1370s, um, and it's a sculpture, so um, the paint's flaked off, but they think they can discern an African face. Um, this is because there is a book that's uh, the Book of the Three Kings uh, by Johannes of Hildesheim, which is a German book uh, that tells uh, the story of the Magi and has many of these uh, details about um, you know, how they came and what they did later, and uh, includes the idea of the African Magus. And here is uh, the carrying of the cross. And you know, we talked about Master Franca being emotional. Uh, you have this charming, lovely image of Mary at, at the Nativity. Um, I guess an image to gladden the heart. And here you have something to sadden the heart. Uh, you have uh, Christ uh, carrying the cross, uh, suffering. We have the angular forms. We have uh, him being tormented by these uh, people with grotesque faces and uh, you know just being very cruel, kicking him, pulling on him, prodding him, um, you know, and you know, making it just as difficult for him as possible. And then back in the corner, we have John, uh, Mary, the mother, weeping. Uh, although no tears, <laughs> not yet. Uh, and the uh, presumably Mary Magdalene, one of the holy women. Master Franca has a very interesting resurrection. Uh, you'll remember the master of the Traybone altarpiece had uh, the red garment on Christ and the uh, banner of the Nativity, and you see some of those flame-like forms here on 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 his car uh, on his garment, uh, and you also see that idea of uh, grotesque faces of the so sleeping, or in his case, sleeping and waking up soldiers. Uh, to show that they are cruel and evil and uh, some kind of exotic uh, elements in the garments, perhaps. Um, but he's quite different than the Master of Trebon in, in uh, a certain respect. Uh, he is literally climbing out of an open sarcophagus. You know, the, the lid has been pushed apart, uh, pushed aside, presumably miraculously. And you, you almost feel this kind of physicality of uh, Christ uh, pushing himself on the uh, edge of the sarcophagus to step out. What is also very unusual is that Christ has his back to the viewer. Um, I can't even think of another resurrection where Christ has his back to the viewer. Uh, so he's, you know, he's really emphasizing the fact that this is. Um, you know, not just a miraculous recovery, uh, but that Christ has uh, been resurrected in body as well as spirit. Master Franca also created some paintings of the Man of Sorrows. In German, he's called the Schmerzenmann, the, the Man of Sorrow, the Man of Suffering, the Man of Pain. <laughs> Uh, and these, again, are Andachsbilder. One is an Andachsbild, a uh, painting for Kant, uh, 
an image to contemplate, a devotional image. Now, the subject of the Man of Sorrows is uh, pretty much a late medieval subject. Um, it seems to come out of Byzantine art and become a very important subject for devotional paintings uh, in Europe. It shows the suffering Christ with the wounds of his passion uh, upright, being displayed essentially uh, for the contemplation of the devotee. And the subject comes out of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah in the Bible, Isaiah 53, which was interpreted as a prophecy of the passion of Christ. And it says, it talks about him, he was the despised and most abject of men, a man of sorrows, goes on and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our sorrows, but he was wounded for our iniquities. He was bruised for our sins. So Christ is displaying his wounds. And sometimes you will see Christ standing up on his own power and sometimes you will see him being held up, for example, by angels. Uh, in this case, the angels are holding up cloths of honor and holding up the mantle of Christ. Um, this also can relate to Eucharistic imagery, um, to another subject uh, of the suffering, bleeding Christ, which is the Mass of St. Gregory. And I'm going to show you a much later uh, uh, print of uh, Albrecht Dürer uh, showing you the Mass of St. Gregory. And the story was that St. Gregory, who was a uh, sixth century pope, was saying Mass and one of the, I think the assisting priests, had some doubts about this. Oh, is that not really the body of Christ? You know, he's thinking these things. And as Gregory says the consecration, the bleeding body of Christ appears on the altar during the Mass. And, you know, the doubting priest sees this and uh, believes. Uh, so this becomes a, a story of a miraculous witness to transubstantiation, to the idea that the bread and the wine of the Eucharist are transformed into, uh, their very substance is transformed into um, the body and blood of Christ. And here you see you know, Christ uh, standing as though he's uh, coming out of his sarcophagus, showing his bleeding body, holding up his hands. Uh, and he's accompanied in this case by the instruments of the passion, uh, the objects uh, that uh, caused his suffering, such as the column of the flagellation, the cross itself, uh, the uh, crown of thorns, the nails, the uh, spear that pierced his side, the, uh, the spear that had uh, the lance that was held up with a sponge on it that was soaked in vinegar uh, for Christ to drink. Now, in Master Franca's Man of Sorrows, you don't have all that narrative. I said they're related, they're not exactly the same image. Um, but both of them are testifying to the suffering of Christ uh, that redeems the sins of mankind. Both refer to the suffering of Christ that are believed to atone for and redeem the sins of mankind, uh, allowing people to go to heaven. Um, we see some other details here. If you look at those little angels who are holding up the brocade cloth in the foreground, uh, one of them on Christ's right, our left, is holding lilies. 
And the one on uh, our right would be uh, Christ's left, the, his, his sinestro or bad side. Uh, you put the bad stuff on, the, on Christ's left, um, so it's our right, uh, is holding a, a sword. Now, when you see images of the Last Judgment, sometimes there will be a sword and a lily next to Christ. Uh, the sword refers to the justice of the judgment. Uh, the lily refers to mercy in this case. And you can see that uh, different objects can mean different things in different contexts. The lily is a symbol of Mary's virginity in an Annunciation, but in a Last Judgment, it's a symbol of mercy. And of course, this reminds us, you know, that you know we will be judged, and it is only through um, the atonement of Christ, only because of his death, that anyone, you know has any hope of being saved because justice would, uh, according to Christians, would, would condemn everyone to hell. But mercy argues for their salvation. And uh, so God sent his only begotten son uh, to die on the cross uh, to uh, atone for all of the sins of mankind. And so here the suffering Christ is saying, behold what I have suffered for you. This is an Andachs builder. It's it's a devotional picture. You're supposed to uh, look at this and literally weep at the suffering of Christ. And so it's combining imagery from two different traditions, uh, that Eucharistic idea from the Mass of St. Gregory and the idea of expiatory redemption, uh, of Christ atoning for the sins of human beings from the Last Judgment. And frequently in the Last Judgment, you will see Christ displaying his wounds. And of course, there is the verse, surely he has borne our infirmities, carried our sorrows, but he was wounded for our iniquities. He was bruised for our sins. And hey, here's another one of these uh, images of the man of sorrows, also attributed to Master Franca. Uh, in this case, uh, Christ is this very frail figure uh, it's, it's almost as though he cannot hold himself up, and so this angel must hold him up. And in this case, we're seeing instruments of the passion, um, the whip, uh, you know, the, uh, the lance and the spear, the cross, uh, the column of the flagellation. Uh, it's a bit more abstract. Uh, Grace's body seems uh, more spindly, uh, but it certainly gets through the same idea of suffering uh, and sorrow. You know, you're supposed to say mea culpa. I caused this.